Back to ABC 7 at 4. This is National Eating Disorder Awareness Week. It's estimated that over 28 million Americans will have an eating disorder in their lifetime. ABC 7 medical contributor Dr. Ogachiga Alozi with Sunset West Health is here with some facts. Now, doctor, when we think of eating disorders, we typically think of women in their teens, but that's not always the case, is it? Yeah, I think it's important for people to understand that this is across the board. Stereotypically, we talk about young females, but it can be men. It can be women, it can be older, it can be younger. In fact, in the state of Texas, it's anticipated that somewhere between 9 and 10 percent of individuals will actually have an eating disorder in their lifetime. Doctor, how many different types of eating disorders are there? So there's somewhere between 7 and 10. It really depends on how you break it down. The two most common are the ones we talk about most often, right? There's anorexia nervosa and there's bulimia. Bulimia is the one where we talk about people eating and then vomiting, that kind of binge sort of pattern. But there's another thing that's really important to note, especially in younger individuals and people that are older, especially in women, it's something called pica or pica. That's when they eat a lot of ice, they may eat tissue paper or toilet paper, and it can actually lead to anemia because they're not getting the vitamins they need to produce enough hemoglobin and red blood cells. Doctor, talk about the warning signs that parents, friends, loved ones can watch out for. Yeah, so this is a busy slide, but I'm going to kick in and tune in on one thing really, which is that evidence of the purging disorder. When you have a child or even an adult that suddenly after eating within 30 minutes goes to the bathroom a lot or disappears after a meal, that's a huge warning sign. A lot of times too, if you have somebody who all of a sudden has a lot of cavities or a lot of discoloration of their teeth, that's from vomiting. Or you can just look at their hands as well and they can have scratch marks on their hands from their teeth. Doctor, and feelings of depression, anxiety are often associated with eating disorders and there's been a dramatic increase in teen girls who are dealing with mental health issues on top of this order. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I think our society as a whole has changed. It's become more stressful. Part of that is social media. Part of that is the economy. Part of that's the demands put on people. But I think it's really important if you notice here, between 2019 and 2021, which I really call our COVID years, there was a dramatic increase, specifically in teenage girls. And I think that's really what we need to key in on as well. Some of those symptoms of depression, some of those feelings of sadness or hopelessness, are they more prevalent between boys or girls? You know, we talk about this all the time, and it is more prevalent in females, but that's not the only thing to look at. We are in a Hispanic community, and Hispanics seem to have this more than Asian, black, and whites when it comes to depression and sadness. What's remarkable is that black students seem to have more attempted suicide. But again, going back to the beginning, this can happen to anybody. And doctor, talk to us about the factors that can really shape a young person's mental health. You know, I think it's important when you look at this slide to realize that there's a lot of things that go into it. Obviously, there's some individual hormonal issues, your parents, your home life, community environment. But again, what COVID showed us is that the societal effect of certain things can have huge effects on how people encompass the world and look at their happiness or lack thereof. And we understand we're learning more from a survey conducted by NAMI about teens and their mental health. Yeah, the National Association of Mental Illness. And so I think, again, here's the two takeaways from here. A lot of information is 95% of these teens do feel comfortable talking to their parents. So if you're a parent out there and you're concerned, have those open dialogues with your kid. The other thing, and this is where the independent school districts come into play, you have to have mental health counselors, right? Two out of three of every kid really does feel that they should be able to get some help or talk to somebody at school. Now, Doctor, we talked a lot about the signs, the symptoms. Now, what kind of solutions are there? What local resources can families, friends, loved ones, and young people themselves access? Yeah, so I think the good thing, and I say this all the time, is that even though we are underserved, there's a lot of resources in our community, whether it's Atlantis, NAMI, Project Vita, the Child Guidance Center, Emergence Health Network. I will specifically call out the Child Psychiatric Access Network. It's online. They have a phone number. This is really important if you don't know where to go you can call them and they can find providers and resources in your community that can get to you within a day or two and set up those appointments. Again, it's important that people understand these resources. Hopefully we can post this online later. There are opportunities in our community, but be on the lookout for those signs. Our society is changing and we have to be vigilant. Doctor, thank you so much. That was ABC7 medical contributor, Dr. Ogachika Alosi. Thanks so much for your time, doctor. Thank you.